It's a warm day here in Rhode Island as we really are coming to the end of the middle of fall. It's probably the last warm day we'll have for a while. The leaves are almost at peak foliage and it feels like in this next week when we're expecting rain and wind that most of the leaves will be gone. It feels like nature is making a transition. We're about 10 days away from the general election here in 2020, and the country is feeling particularly anxious. The state is feeling anxious. And I want to invite all of us across the state of Rhode Island and everyone listening to this meditation to focus on prayers and being present, present to whatever God is doing in this moment and open to what might be the unexpected gift that God is giving us. A reading from the 22nd chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, Which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer. Nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. Here ends the reading. This week's reading from Matthew continues in this series of controversies and entrapment stories that we have that Matthew presents as leading up to the climactic moments of Holy Week. In this particular one, I'm taken by what Jesus is asked about the greatest commandment. Now, there were lots of people in that day summarizing the law. And so what Jesus says isn't that extraordinary. He quotes from two places in Hebrew scripture to say, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. And then he goes on and says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think one of those is from Leviticus and one of those is from Deuteronomy. But what Matthew does is he puts another set of words in between them that when Jesus is asked this question in the other parallel gospels, in Mark's gospel or in Luke's gospel, they don't include this language. And and Jesus says, the second is like unto it. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, The second is the equivalent of the first. Loving God is equivalent to loving your neighbor. And and the way mathematics works is loving your neighbor is equivalent to loving God. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of implication in that equivalent, that equal sign. Do you remember Einstein's great equation, E equals mc squared? What's so extraordinary about that as a scientist is that it is saying that energy and matter are equivalent. And in fact, technically, in in physics, we don't talk about mass. We talk about mass energy because you can store energy in mass and you can release energy in mass. Fusion and fission 
are both ways of letting the energy that is trapped in matter out. And, and they do extraordinary things. They make energy, electricity out of water. They unleash unimaginable destructive forces. I wonder what Einstein thought when he went through his equations and got to the place where he was saying E equals MC squared. It, it, it's a breathtaking assertion, this idea that the ability to change the state of something, which is what energy is, is equivalent to mass, to matter, to the thing that is linked to space-time in some way. We're still figuring out all the implications of that equal signs, and we're not done yet. So when Jesus uses an equal sign with the love of God and the love of neighbor, I wonder if we have fully thought through all the implications. There's this thing that happens with Christians so often where we will look at the way somebody else is worshiping God and our immediate response is that they're worshiping God the wrong way or they're doing faith wrong. They're not saying the creeds the way we think they should be said or they're not saying them at all. They're focusing on relationships for the poor. There are advocacy groups. They are prophetic voices. They are marching in the streets and they're not coming into church or they're staying in church and praying around an altar for the poor, but they're not going outside to lift a finger to help them. And I can't tell you how many times I have been with people, very well-meaning, who are saying to me and pointing at somebody else, you know, they're just doing church wrong. They don't get it. But isn't it extraordinary that what Jesus is saying is that both are right. People who focus their attention on worship, people who are focusing their attention on God, loving God above all other things, they're doing exactly the same right kind of thing as the people who are marching in the streets, the people who are organizing food club, food pantries, the people who are creating soup kitchens, the people who are working in government to alleviate the poverty that's grinding people under its heel. That's just as important. It's as if Jesus is saying people who are deists, who are focused completely on God, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, obviously, and people who are humanists, who are focusing completely on humanity and humanity's needs, they're doing the same thing. They are equivalent. Energy is the same as matter. This thing that allows us to transform the world is the same as a solid, solid, permanent thing. It, it, it's extraordinary to imagine. Looking up is the same as looking out. Looking in the eyes of your fellow human being is just the same as looking up and trying to peer into the mystery of God's revelation of God's self. I, at one level, I think maybe the people who are trying to trap Jesus were getting, trying to get him to say, well, the ceremonial law isn't important. What's important is the moral nature behind the law. Or maybe the other way around, they were trying to get him to say that the ceremonial teachings of the law are more important than the moral, the moral weight of the law. But Jesus doesn't say that at all. He, if you remember from last week, he's rejecting this arbitrary binary construct that they are trying to force him into. You have to do this or that. And he says, no, they're both. They are both equivalent. I wonder if we might just sort of step back and recognize that at one level, what Jesus is saying is there are two pathways that allow us to fully enter the kingdom of God. There is a pathway where we focus our entire being on the adoration of God. And there is a pathway where we focus all of our strength and all of our energy on caring for the people around us, loving our neighbor as ourselves, loving God with everything we have in us, that they're the same. It's as if you're climbing a mountain 
and you're trying to get to the peak and one group of people is coming from the southern face of the mountain and the other group of people is coming from the northern face of the mountain and they're both climbing and they're sure that they are doing something that no one else is doing because they can't see the other people on the mountain. And, and, and yet when they get to the peak, they discover that there were people who were about to join them that were coming a completely different route. That equal sign, that equivalence is like unto it, it has so much to teach us and so much meaning. What if that was true in society? What if that was true in everyday life, that instead of saying that people are doing things wrong, we try to understand what they're attempting to achieve. If they are trying to respond to injustice in the world by entreating God to act, isn't that as powerful for those of us who believe that God does act as somebody who takes it upon themselves to do what they think God should be doing, or who insert themselves as God's hands and feet into the problem. We're both sure that what we're trying to do is make the situation better. We're just disagreeing on the tactics. We're disagreeing on which levers to push and pull on. We're climbing different sides of the face of a mountain and thanks be to God, I think we're about to be deeply surprised when we discover that we're not the only ones climbing the mountain and that there are so many ways for us to come into the presence of God. There are so many ways for us to live out and participate in God's mission in the world. This idea of rejecting the binary and finding a third way, finding a bridge way, it's kind of what we are about as Episcopalians. And it's what I hope we remember. Because I think what we have to share is incredibly important. We're not the only ones who are sharing it. And we're not the only ones who believe this. But we probably should do what we can to make sure other people know what it is that we value most. And we should ask them what it is that they value most and what it is that they are trying to accomplish with the work and the efforts that they are doing. Because we may find that we're all climbing the same mountain. And we may find that at the end, we are all entering into the presence of the same God who created us all. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The blessing of the one, holy and undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you this day this week, and always. Amen.